to our fourth lesson in educational statistics. Uh, my name is Dr. Ruth Pinguri, uh, Senior Lecturer in Education, Mount Kenya University. Uh, in our previous lesson, uh, we looked at the various data presentation uh, procedures. We looked at the textual data presentation procedures. Uh, we also looked at the tabular data presentation procedures and we were also able to explore the graphical presentation uh, procedures. In today's lesson, uh, we shall be looking at the shapes of distribution, and we are going to look at the two categories, uh, the non-normal distribution shapes, uh, which we shall be able to explore the modality, the skewness, and the kurtosis. We shall also be able to look at the normal distribution and finally, uh, we shall be able to look at the frequency distribution. So we want to first of all begin by defining uh, the shapes of distribution, measuring the pattern of the data within a data set. We have the various uh, types of data as we have looked at, but the quantitative data, and we have looked at the various uh, data presentation procedures and later on, we shall be looking at the shapes of distribution because the shapes of distribution will tell us something in relationship to the normal distribution paths. We, shall also, we have also looked at the qualitative data, which we have said it is numerical in nature. So what is the importance of looking at the shapes of uh, distribution? One, the shapes of distribution can assist in identifying the descriptive statistics, as we had discussed earlier, we talked about the measures of frequency, the measures of central tendency, and the appropriate in research, the appropriateness in research. By looking at the shapes of data, we can be able to select uh, which, may, which, which uh, descriptive statistics will be appropriate to be used. Also, the, distri the distribution of shapes can also tell us uh, the type of data and in relationship uh, to other uh, types of uh, data. For example, when we use the measures of central tendency, we can be able to tell the relationship between the mean, the mid, the mode, and the median. The data, if the data is normally distributed, then we are going to see the mean, the mode, and the median are all the same. And if it's not, they are going to be different. Also, the shapes of data are important because they are able to tell us whether the data is skewed to the left or to the right, or whether the data has the process. Uh, all this is going to be possible uh, through looking at various uh, types of uh, shapes of distribution. We want to begin by looking at uh, the three types of non distribution shapes that is, the modality, the skewness, and the kurtosis. So, this non, uh, the types of distribution skills that we have here, we are going to tell us whether uh, the data is symmetrical, that is one of the properties of the features of the non-skewed uh, uh, distribution, asymmetrical, meaning the mean, the mode, and the median are not the same, and then the mean, the median, and the mode will have different uh, values, therefore, are uh, missing what we call the normal uh, distribution curve. They are also going, going to help us to look at the data trends and get to know which ones are higher or low at uh, the end of each uh, term. Uh, this is the importance of looking at the non uh, distributed, the non normal distributed uh, shapes. So let's begin with the modality. What is modality? Modality is determined by the number of pits it contains. So what are pits? As we can see from the diagram provided here, this is a peak. This is a peak. So modality of a shape will be determined by the number of takes. For example, the unimodal 
means that the distribution has only one peak. As you can see very clearly, this one has one peak, and it's called the unimodal. And then the bimodal, a bimodal distribution, has two values that are far occur frequently. So it has two peaks, and you can see it very clearly from the diagram uh, provided here. Then we have the multi model, which has several frequent occurring values, that is the multiple peaks, and you can see a very good example from here. And finally, we have the uniform model. We have the uniform model, which is equally distributed, where the peaks are equally distributed. Can you see very clearly from the diagram that this is the uni model because this one gives us one peak? And then we have the bi model, we have a peak here, and we also have a peak here, giving us a bi model. And then we have the multi model, we have a peak here, and another one in the middle, and then we have another one here at the far end. And then we have the uniform model here, and you can see clearly all the shapes are the same. All the shapes are the same, giving us the uniform. So the next component that we need to think about as we look at the shapes of distribution is the skewness and its types. What is skewness? The skewness measures the symmetrical of a distribution. The symmetrical in which the right half, as you can see here, and the other half, as you can see the left half, they mirror each other. So this is the symmetrical, and that is what is measured by the skewness. A perfect symmetrical data set have a skewness of zero, and this is what I'm talking about. This half here, and the half here, they are all equal, so the skewness is zero. And this is the skewness uh, for the normal distribution, the skewness for the normal distribution. But we are also going to say that the skewness can also can either be negative or can even be positive, where it's going to pull one tail to one side and then there will be the heat of all the other figures on one side. So when we look at the skewness of zero, we can say the mean, the median, and the mode are the same. And that is what we call the symmetrical. And that is the one in between here, the one, the blue one. You can see the symmetrical. Then we can talk of the positive skewedness, positive skewedness, or the positive skew, where the data is fired up to the left. You can see all this data is fired up to the left, and the tail is this way, giving us the positive skew. Then we can also talk about the negative skewedness, where the data is fired up to the right, and the tail is on the other side, meaning the mean is less than the medium and is less than the mode. And that is what we call the skewness, the positive skewness and the negative skewness. In terms of the normality, the symmetrical, the one that is symmetrical here, you can see very clearly the mean, the median, and the mode are the same because the skewness is measuring the symmetrical. But you can see the positive skew where the data is heat tapped to the left. You can see very clearly the mean is greater than the median and the median is greater than the mode, giving us a positive skew. When we look at the negative skew in terms of the normal distribution, it is very, very clear that the data is heat tapped to the right and the tail is protruding to the, left, to, the, to, the, to the left, meaning the mode is greater than the median and is greater than the mean. Again, measuring the symmetrical. We also use a formula when it comes to measuring the skewness. We use the SK here, standing for the skewness, 
and then we have 3 into mean minus median divided by the standard deviation, where well, if the skewness turns out to be zero, then it means we have a normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode are the same, giving us a symmetrical distribution. If the skewness from this formula turns out to be more, more than zero, then it means the mean is larger, the median is larger than the median, and is larger than the mode, implying that we have the positively skewed distribution. And if the skewness is less than zero, then it means the mean is less than the median and is less than the mode, implying that we have the negative as distribution. Our third component is the kurtosis. We want to look at the kurtosis. We have looked at the number of peaks in the modality. We have looked at the symmetrical distribution. And now we want to look at the kurtosis, which describes the thickness and the distribution or the levels of the thickness of distribution. We want to see how thick are the peaks. So the kurtosis is a specific measure that defines how heavy the tails of the distribution differ from the normal distribution tails. Uh, from the normal distribution tails. The kurtosis is normally um, calculated in terms of 3, so the kurtosis is going to be 3. But later on, there is the excess kurtosis, which is normally used in research. We normally use the excess kurtosis in research, which indicates you must subtract uh, 3 from the kurtosis so that it can give us the normal distribution figure. Remember, everything in research, the central theorem falls under the normal distribution. So using the formula provided here of the skewness, the total of n, which is the number of variables in the distribution, minus x minus x min, then power 3 divided by n minus 1, and then you multiply by q3. We are the x1 is the nth random variable, where this x here is the mean of the distribution, and then the n is the number of variables, and then we have the standard deviation. That is the formula that we normally use uh, to calculate the kurtosis of a distribution. So if the kurtosis is greater than zero, this implies that the kurtosis is practical. The kurtosis is practical because the kurtosis is greater than zero. If the kurtosis is equal to zero, then the distribution is said to be mesocartic. That is, it is normal, normally distributed. And if the kurtosis is greater than zero, then the distribution is said to be leptocratic. The distribution is said to be leptocratic. And we can look at these figures now as we compare. Now we have the peakedness. Remember, we started by looking at the peakedness, the number of peaks. That was now the modality. We went ahead, we looked at the skewness, we looked at the symmetrical, we looked at the symmetrical using the skewness. And then, at this level, we are interested in looking at the thickness. We are interested in looking at the thickness. And that's why we are saying the mesocartic is the one that has the zero as the kaposis value, which gives us the symmetrical, which is the normal distribution curve, where the mean is equal to the median and is equal to the mode. And then we have the reptocratic, where the distributions are high and thin. And we can see them very, very clearly. Very, very high and thin, or tall and skinny. And we have seen that the kurtosis is less than uh, zero. 
So it moves away uh, from the normal distribution. And then we have the protopathic, where the distribution is thick. And we can see the blue one. The distribution is uh, thick and spread out. You can see it's clearly spread out. And then it moves away from the bell curve. It is short and it's fat. And we have said the kathosis here is greater than zero. So we are trying to measure everything in relationship to the normal distribution curve. So what is a normal distribution curve? This is a continuous distribution of the data that has shapes of symmetrical bell curve. We are the mean, the mode, and the median are going to be the same. So what are the characteristics? One, symmetrical. The left hand and the right hand are the same by size. When we have the unimodal, there is only one mode or one peak in a normal distribution curve. Then we have the astomatic. Normal distribution curves are continuous and they have tails that are asymptotic, which means they approach and they never touch each other. And now you can see very clearly, they are going to approach, the tails are approaching, but they will not touch each other, they cannot touch each other. And then the mid, the, media, the mean, the median, and the mode, they all center in the middle. They all center in the middle because they are equal. And then it has the bell shape, and we can see very, very clearly that is the bell shape. And finally, the total area of the normal curve is normally one, with the left being half and the other left are being, with one side being half and the other side are being half. So what is the importance? Why are we dealing with the shapes of distribution? And what is the importance of the normal distribution curve? One, it allows the statisticians to use the central beam to measure the relationship of the various variables. It also puts into check statistically in terms of control over the control of the variables, the relationship between each of the variables. It is also popularly used to know the disciplines of study, and therefore it is commonly understood by all the disciplines uh, that deal with the statistics. It defeats many natural phenomena like height, like psychological, like blood pressure. If you are going to measure the height of personalities, all these natural phenomena have can fall under the normal distribution. It also fits many psychological and educational variables, and that's why it's commonly used in educational statistics and also in all the other humanities. And then it allows us to be able to drive uh, the normal distribution curve, making it uh, very, very critical in the areas of statistics. Finally, we come to the frequency distribution. As I mentioned earlier, frequency distribution allows us to see the frequencies, and it's mostly used to summarize the categorical variables. Earlier, we talked about the various types of data. We talked about the categorical variables. It allows us to present either in graphical or tabular form and to display, to display the number of observations uh, given the intervals, given the various intervals. So what, are, what types of uh, distribution, frequency distributions uh, do we have? We have five of them. The first one being the ungrouped frequency distribution, followed by the grouped frequency distribution, the cumulative frequency distribution, the relative frequency distribution, and the relative cumulative frequency distribution. So let's look at the ungrouped one. We look at this data. This data is ungrouped, meaning it is not in intervals. 
So we have this data that is provided, and then we are supposed to draw a frequency distribution. If you look at this data, you bring, you organize it from the smallest to the largest. You look at the 136 here, you get here PS ones, 138, twice, 139 ones, and the rest of them. And then we have been able to draw this frequency. And you can see we can be able to uh, draw conclusions on this data as it appears in the frequencies. And then we have the ungrouped frequencies. You can see the ungrouped frequencies with large sets of data. Where we have large sets of data, you can see we are able to use the studies. We can be able to use the studies. This is for about 100 students. And you can see the data for 100 students can be fitted in these multiples because we are able to use the, we are able to, to use the studies for ungrouped frequencies. And then we have the group frequency distribution where we have the intervals 2 to 4, 4 to 6, 6 to 8, 8 to 10, and 10 to 12. And then you can see the studies that are giving us the frequencies. All of these amount of data has been summarized in that and the group frequency distribution. And then we have the next one, which is the cumulative frequency, which is defined by running the totals of the frequencies. These are the frequencies we have here. We run the totals of the frequencies, which is the sum of all the previous frequencies up to the current point. We take this frequency through there, and then 2 plus 7, 2 plus 1, and then we have the 3 plus 3, and then the 6 plus 7, and it gives us the cumulative uh, frequency, it gives us the cumulative frequency there. And then we have the relative uh, frequency distribution, which can be provided in fractions, percentages, and decimals. So we have this data that is grouped. We have the frequencies. And then we add the frequencies here to give us 20 from this data. And then we can give the 6 out of 20. These are the relative frequencies in fractions. We can also multiply by 100 to give us the percentages. And that's how we calculate the relative frequency. And then we have the next one, which is the relative cumulative frequency, which is the fraction or percentages of the total sum of frequencies. Again, using the same example here, we have the example provided here. These are the intervals. Then we have the frequencies out of 100. And then we can calculate the relative frequency by taking the 5 divided by 100, and then we get the fractions, and we can also get the cumulative frequency, cumulative relative frequency, where you add the 0 0.05, you add the 3 here, it gives us the 0 0.08, then you add the 0 0.15, we keep adding, we keep adding until we get 1. So the relative cumulative frequency is normally 1. So, what is the importance of the frequency distribution? One, it will assist us display the information in the visuals. We have been able to see clearly that information. It's a lot of information, but we can see it visually. It is also a very easy table to, uh, to understand and to portray the number of occurrences of particular characteristics. And then it makes it helps us to give the, to give us the, the detailed analysis of the information of a given uh, characteristics. With that, what have we been able to cover today? We have looked at the modalities, which we have called the number of peaks. We have also looked at the skewness, which we have called the symmetrical. We have also looked at the kurtosis, which we have called the spread 
of the data. And finally, we have looked at the normal distribution curve and its utility in statistical research. And thank you. We have come to the end of our lesson number four. We shall be continuing from there. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.